Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rich Corsi. He is the Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at Portland State University in Oregon. And he's actually been working on indoor air research for uh, about 30 years. And that includes the interactions of volatile organic compounds and materials. He's led um, a very unique NSF IGERT program that educates students in indoor air chemistry. And he's currently the president of the Academy of Fellows for the International Society of Indoor Air and Climate. Rich. 30 years, I guess. I, I'm the old person up here, I guess. So uh, thanks for, for coming out during lunch. I appreciate that very much. Um, I started my career um, a long time ago and mostly doing outdoor air pollution research back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. I got interested in indoor air quality uh, in the 1990s for two main reasons. Number one was the recognition of how much time we as Americans spend indoors. So the average American lives to be about 79 years old. We spend 70 of our 79 years, almost 70 of our 79 years, domiciled inside of buildings. Think about that. That's a greater fraction of time than whales spend submerged below the surface of the ocean. We're indoor creatures, and we spend 54 of our 79 years inside of our own homes. So when it comes to being exposed to things, our home is a place where we get a lot of exposure to air pollution and other things. So my focus, my research focus, has been for the last 15 years or so on how pollutants interact with indoor materials. Um, when I walk into a room like this, I see carpet, I see ceiling tile, I see latex paint. I also see polyurethane foam in your chairs that you're sitting on. I see your clothes, I see your skin oils, I see your hair, and I see some very supersized cookies that some of you have been eating. And I'll come back to food and polyurethane foam in just a moment. Uh, both potentially very important um, uh, indoor materials. So why are indoor surfaces important? Well, they're important because they're huge. When you look at the surface area of materials inside of buildings and divide that by the volume of air in a building, that ratio, the surface to volume ratio, is 300 to 1,000 times that ratio outdoors. So pollutants in the indoor environment come in contact with materials a lot more than pollutants do in the outdoor environment. Pollutants are dramatically, our materials indoors are dramatically different. The latex paint on the walls is different than the skin oils on your face. So they're kind of complex and interesting. They're dynamic, as Nina said. They change over time. They accumulate organic films and dust and water films, et cetera. Materials are emission sources to the indoor environment. They emit bad things to the indoor environment. And as I said, pollutants interact with them. Gaseous pollutants stick to them and then unstick from them as... Ugo was talking about adsorption, desorption processes. Particles deposit on surfaces. And when particles deposit on surfaces, the surfaces can actually transform those particles. And then chemical reactions occur between oxidants and surfaces. So I'm going to give you examples of each of those phenomena I just mentioned in the remainder of my talk. My team has done a lot of research on how uh, gaseous pollutants indoors stick to or adsorb to ranges of indoor materials and how quickly they come off. And sometimes they come off in seconds or minutes, sometimes they come off in weeks, sometimes they come off in years. It depends on the material and the pollutant. So what we do is we, took, we put materials in, um, oops, not working. We put materials in these little stainless steel chambers. We close up the chamber. We pass uh, high purity air through the chamber and then we inject a chemical and we look to see how much of that chemical actually sticks to the material. Then we stop injecting the chemical and we see how long it takes to come off. So this is for this plot here, which I'll explain in just a moment. It's just for one chemical, but we have these for dozens of chemicals and dozens of different types of materials. The vertical axis, think of that as just the level of pollutant in the air inside the chamber. And then the horizontal axis is the time of exposure, the time at which a material is exposed to this particular pollutant, dichlorobenzene. Um, if there's no sticking to the material, if the chemical is not sticking to the material at all, the data should fall on that solid pink line that you see up at the top. So that's the no stick line, if you will. And the further you are away from that line, the more the pollutant is actually sticking to the material. And so we see here that materials interacting with this pollutant fall into three main categories, those that don't have a lot of stickiness with the material, those that are kind of somewhere in between, and those that 
adsorb a lot of that particular chemical. And I can talk about all the materials on here for the next two hours, which I don't have time to do. So I'm going to focus on that last group. Those were that, that, that's the group where a lot of sticking of this particular chemical happens, and that happens to be mostly carpet with polyurethane foam cushion underneath. So we took, whoops, so we took, um, we took carpet and we looked at it as a system, all the major components, and then dissected the carpet. So you can see nylon fibers here, the polypropylene backing that holds the fibers in place, and the bonded polyurethane cushion underneath the carpet. And we repeated this experiment with the components of the carpet. And what you see on that plot on the right is the exact type of plot that I just explained to you. Um, the pink squares that you see that are close to the no stick line, those are nylon fibers. And that makes sense. Nylon fibers tend to be stain resistant. They have a chemical on them that causes stuff not to stick to them. And we see very little of this relatively sticky chemical not sticking to nylon fibers. The green triangles you see are the polypropylene backing that, that holds the fibers in place so that some of the chemicals sticking to the polypropylene fibers below, uh, polypropylene backing below the fibers. Um, the asterisks are the, are the polypropylene backing plus the fibers. And then if you move down to that next group of curves, those are the actual carpet system, all the pieces put together. And that last dashed blue line is the polyurethane foam cushion exposed by itself with nothing on top of it. The moral of this story is that polyurethane foam collects a lot of stuff in indoor environments. Your sofa cushion, the cushions in the seats that you're sitting on right now, carpet cushions, your, kilo, your pillow cushion, tend to be reservoirs of chemicals. And oftentimes, chemicals get stored in polyurethane foam for a relatively long time. So if you want to know what your house has been exposed to, check out the polyurethane foam, especially if you're buying a new home. All right, so chemicals also desorb from materials. And my team has done some research, and, and a lot more of this research needs to be done on mechanisms that accelerate desorption of things like methamphetamine from indoor materials and meth-contaminated homes. This is not methamphetamine, um, but what we've done is to go into homes and we actually humidify bedrooms or we humidify uh, living rooms and we measure the amount of pollutants in the air in that space before we humidify and after we humidify, right? And what we can see is that before we humidify, the blue bars on the right are considerably lower amount of, and just think of this as the amount of stuff in the air, right? It's a measure of the total mass of pollutants in the air. And the red bars are after we humidify in, in this particular house. And we've done this for six homes, 13 events. And every single time when we increase the relative humidity within reasonable bounds, 40% to 60%, 45% to 60%, we see gushes of chemicals coming off of materials into the indoor space. This is fascinating. It suggests that when you have RH cycling in a house, that the people in the house are going to be exposed to gushes of chemicals whenever the relative humidity increases. And that's an area of research that we need to do a lot more of, has impacts potentially on damp buildings. Uh, with energy savings, we're trying to readjust thermostats now that change the cycling of the of the HVAC system, which might mean higher periods of relative humidity in certain parts of the country, which means exposure to more chemicals. We don't understand the mechanisms, which is interesting. We need more research in that. But think about how we might optimize this. Imagine going into a school classroom, and before the kids get there every day, we humidify the heck out of the classroom. We desorb chemicals off of the materials. And by the way, all the chemicals we identify are things not associated with the surfaces themselves or things that have stuck to the surfaces. They're fragrances and pesticides and things like that. Imagine humidifying and then flushing out a classroom to get rid of the contaminants before kids get to school every day. You know, can we optimize this process? We can do it if we understand it better. All right, particles, as you know, dust deposits on surfaces. And when dust deposits on surfaces, they tend to lie in this very thin, thin boundary layer, the skin of an apple next to the surface. And anything that's coming out of that material tends to have a very high concentration, a very high level of stuff coming out of the material in that thin boundary layer. So the dust that's sitting on a, on a piece of material is going to actually accumulate whatever's coming out of the material. And that can be particularly important if they're things like flame retardants or plasticizers that are endocrine disrupting chemicals that accumulate in the dust and then somebody walks across the dust or a child crawls across the dust and it's resuspended and you breathe it, that becomes a mechanism for really getting those concentrated pollutants into your lungs. So the test house again, which you've already heard about, I won't explain it, but the flooring of the test house 
is filled with a chemical called butyl benzyl phthalate. It's a plasticizer. It is an endocrine disrupting chemical. And it's the only material in the test house that has butyl benzyl phthalate in it. So one of my colleagues collected dust samples from all the surfaces in the test house, including the flooring in the test house, and, and analyzed that dust for butyl benzyl phthalate. The red bars that you see here are dust collected off the floor that contain butyl benzyl phthalate. The green bars are dust collected all out of all the other surfaces in the house. So you can see how badly the dust is contaminated that actually falls on the floor that's filled with butyl benzyl phthalate. And, it, and that's a common plasticizer in vinyl flooring. Finally, chemical reactions occur on surfaces. I've done a lot of research on ozone chemistry on indoor surfaces. Um, when ozone reacts with indoor materials, that's a good thing. That's why ozone levels are lower indoors than outdoors, and we know ozone's a harmful chemical. But at the same time, when ozone chemically reacts with surfaces, you always form reaction products, lots of reaction products of different nature, right? And Barbara mentioned that we don't know the, the toxicological effects of a lot of those kinds of chemicals. We just know that we form a lot of them. So one of Barb's colleagues, Glenn Morrison at the University of North Carolina and I, came up with this concept a few years ago called passive removal materials. We said, what if we could redesign indoor environments so that we have materials that remove lots of ozone, which is a good thing, and produce minimal reaction products? We'd like to fill buildings with those kinds of chemicals so we're not exposed to those reaction products. And we've tested over 32 different materials. You see four or five in the upper right-hand corner here that are particularly good at what I just said removing ozone and not forming reaction products. And our very first experiment, what we did is we took a ceiling tile in our test house at the University of Texas, I'm sorry, a ceiling fan, and we created for $2 some activated carbon cloth slippers that fit over the fan blades on, in our test house. Activated carbon is great at removing ozone and doesn't form any reaction products. And you can see by the result in the lower right, the middle orange bar is a measure of the, of the rate of ozone removal in the house. Just by putting $2 worth of activated carbon on fan blades, we removed a huge amount of ozone in our test house without, without uh, producing any additional reaction products. Oops, I keep doing that. Um, and finally, um, more recently, so the, the other end of the research, act, starting with activated carbon, um, clay paints and clay plasters have this magic property. If you get the right kind of clay that's got lots of kaolinite in it, an aluminous silicate compound, mineral, um, you can catalytically decompose ozone with form, without forming any reaction products. And we find certain clay plasters and clay paints that have lots of kaolinite in them very, very effective at removing ozone in indoor environments. Sustained high removals, minimal reaction products. They also re remove organic acids that are in the air, which is great. Uh, organic acids can degrade works of art, for example, buffers water vapor, and we've done studies with human panels to show that human panelists actually feel like the air is cleaner when it's been exposed to clay plaster or clay paint. So my takeaway points are listed here. I'm not going to read all of them. The most important are the last two, which I think there are opportunities to rethink the use of indoor materials as being beneficial for us instead of enemies, right? And a lot of important research is still to be done. This is a wide open field, and I think over the next 10, next decade or so, you're going to see a lot of advances if we focus on this field that improve the healthiness of buildings. That's it. Thanks.